Cool. I will find one. I have at least one dollar. Well, let me check. I might have some boost back then. Are you those either? Cool. I will find one. I have at least one dollar. Well, let me check. I might have some boost back then. Are you those either?
But we wanted to start this with a video that Deer had created here not very long ago uh, to talk about some of the technologies, major forms of technology, automation, artificial intelligence, and where we're going with that and why it's important, how that impacts us. So go ahead, we'll play the video. It's only like about a minute and a half, and then we can break into what we're actually doing as far as the equipment goes. By the year 2050, the global population is expected to grow from 7.8 billion to nearly 10 billion people. One of the greatest challenges that farmers face is growing enough food to feed the world while using the same amount of land we have today and facing challenges like unpredictable weather and labor shortages. This is the mission that drives farmers every single day. For generations, farmers have put in the hard work that often goes unnoticed, spending up to 18 hours a day in the field. To get the most out of every seed, they make countless decisions daily without knowing the impact of those decisions for weeks or months. In an industry of variability, farmers deserve every advantage they can get. And finding their intuition and experience with technologies like AI, automation, machine learning, and cloud computing, farmers can make informed decisions that set them up for success. As stewards of the land, farmers are focused on doing more with less and making sure future generations will be able to work the same fields to provide for their communities and so many others. For 185 years, John Deere has provided farmers with the tools they need so farmers can provide for all of us. So we'll start talking right off the bat with, with our self-propelled sprayers. And really what we're going into here is the seam spray technology that exists out there currently right now today. This technology uses a camera system on a boom to identify weeds in the field as we travel. And then we can turn on and off each individual nozzle body as we're going on this 120 foot boom, 72 nozzle body, we can control those individually to apply chemical, to apply fertilizer. But more importantly, what we're doing is we're using that technology as a way of not having to apply the same amount of chemical over all of the ground, right? It's an influx cost control. Now, if you figure out two, three, four, roughly, we'll say four or five passes of chemical over across 10,000 acres, as far as dollar-wise, the kind of money that we're talking about can be anywhere from two to $400,000 of chemical cost just in and of itself. So we can control that in some way, uh, talk about sustainability of our farms. This is one of the first places that we're gonna start with. Got our clicker? Yeah. yeah. So realistically, farming, as far as an application standpoint, really has changed over the last 20 years. So producers were typically looking at their fields on a, on a broadcast, on a top level on a broadcast, right? So we're managing our fields field by field by field. Even around here, right? Around this area, field by field by field. And as, we, as the technology has increased, right? 2006, we got section control. So now we're dealing with areas within a field, areas within a piece of equipment to control input costs, to control overlap, to control whatever we need to. As we move into 16, with the levels of technology within that, now we're looking at a row by row, right? So now we're learning how to manage our products, manage our crops on a row by row basis. Leading us down to 2020 with the seed and spray technology, um, which we've had now for three years. We were one of four dealerships in the United States that actually had one of these pieces of equipment. Uh, now we're starting to deal with management, farm management practices on a plant level, plant by plant. And so that's kind of the transition we've seen with this technology uh, in the last 20 years. So that's kind of the, the evolution, if you will, uh, of the farming as far as a product application standpoint. 
And it's actually, I mean, I know we're just covering sprayers right, right here, but this is transition in all of our equipment, right? Um, so you'll see that going forward. But. So they're saying using a camera system. So we've got 36 cameras mounted across our boom, and those cameras are scanning 2,000 square feet every second. Right? And so as we're traveling with that sprayer, it's looking for green material, green plant. It sees a green plant, sprays for it. Right? So we can get rid of any of those weeds beforehand. They're not direct competition for our wheat, barley, peas, soybeans, whatever. Right, whatever our crop is. We're trying to eliminate competition. The trick has always been that in the past, we've always had to use that sprayer as a whole entity. So it's either all spraying or all not spraying. Even when there wasn't anything to be spraying for, we still had to be putting down input costs. We still had to be using chemical. Now with the introduction of sea and spray, now we're using it so that we're only spraying when we have to, controlling those input costs. And that's the biggest thing input costs for us. Like when we talked about the opening video, how many people we're gonna get where we don't have any more land. So we're really honed in on not so much the biggest piece of equipment, but what can we get the best out of this equipment? And that progression that we made all the way up to the vision or to the cameras on this, it's, it's where the future's going. So as far as the technology that we talk about here, it can get applied into any other piece of equipment that we're gonna be using. So this is the AI side of things. This is artificial intelligence. It's the ability for a system to look, learn different weeds, and where you'll see where our, where the Sea and Spray Ultima is going, which has just come out. We'll start seeing that next year and the year after. That has the ability to distinguish wheat from crop. So as it's going through the field, right, it'll say that's corn, that's corn, that's corn, that's red wheat, and I can spray for just that specifically. At 12 miles an hour, 120 feet wide. And it's a pretty amazing system. I mean, because this camera is picking up that view, picking up that weed, sending it to these processors, and then fiber optic back right to your nozzle body, and those are firing at 12 miles an hour. And there's no way we can do it that quick. All self contained on the sprayer. On the sprayer. Yeah. How many? I may have experience or some type of background in what we're talking about. As far as agriculture, but just... How many have been around sprayers? All right. Good deal. So we talk about the sprayer, like the select, when we talk to cameras, it's kind of like an entry got three left. <coughs> right now, if it sees green, it's going to spray. Once we start getting into the progression, like Jim said, the ultimate, now we're actually identification. So these cameras are going from actually seeing green, yeah, I'll kill it. Now they're like, well, wait a minute, I'm a little bit better. I could... It's green, but it's actually wheat. Okay. That's the progress we're making. So we took a little screenshot. It's really hard to see. This was some of our field trials out west. Uh, but the types of plants that we're looking for and that the system is scanning for, we're talking about weeds that are somewhere around that half to three quarters of an inch tall. Is that what we're, looking for? we're talking about blades of grass out there. The kind of stuff that most people, as they're walking, would never see that the camera can pick up. Because I think this field, I think the pictures are the same. Will the gym fool you? So a lot of these pictures, you can see we do have blue dye in it. So part of our job is, is we're going to ground through what we have for technology. So we filled this sprayer with chemical roundup, and then we put blue dye in it so we could actually see what we're hitting when it was spraying. Jim was doing all the driving. I was on the ground with the camera. We drew straws. Up and in the ground. Somewhere. Did you really draw straws? No, we didn't. <laughs> but like the grower we're at here, we asked him, like, what's your field look like? He's like, it's, it's really clean. You don't have to work out spray. It's perfect field really for you guys to see the spray. Head out there. There's no weeds out there. We get out there and this thing's spraying all the time. We're like, well, I suppose I should get out and check it because this thing's spraying quite a bit. Now. And like Jim said, one inch foxtail barley. This little blade of grass sticking out of the ground. Sure enough, yeah, it's there. I spread yeah, it's yeah, it's there. It's there. So as far as us not only learning the technology, but when we run it, we'll actually make sure it's good when it's full to And as far as seeing spray, when we talk about the weed identification or just the green identification, yes, that thing does what it says it will do. It will pick up small weed. Excellent. 
So here's the translation of data back into the system. So this is what the sprayer actually did. And this is a spray map. So everything that is in a color, that's an area or a point that the sprayer sprayed. Everything that is a, kind of a light gray there, that's area in the field that we didn't have to spray anything. But we traditionally would have sprayed regardless. So we're talking area covered, not sprayed, 36%. 36% of the field we would have sprayed before and not had any choice. And now we do. Which is immediately money saved. Yes. Yeah. And this technology, when we first went through the slide of the progression of the way from broadcast to section control to our individual nozzle control, but then to see and spray, we also got this technology package. It's still just a regular R sprayer that we call Exactify with the technology package, package on it that's actually vision. So we're still just, we're with our base sprayer. What's your next one? This is another picture of our seeds for ultimate camera. Uh, like I said, 36 ton. Next one. So here's what some of the, some of the screens we were showing for uh, some of the extension personnel on, on why we're using this kind of technology, sustainability and free improved weed control. Uh, most of it is an input cost efficiency. Um, this is the ROI that the producers are looking from us, why we want to spend the kind of money that we're talking about, you know, the several, several hundreds of thousands of dollars to this kind of level of technology, why we want it. Okay. And one thing with the ultimate that I know we talked about a little bit, but it does have two tanks on it. So what it allows you to do is, I can spray one thing out of the front tank and something different on the back, uh, which is really cutting down on costs. Uh, I only maybe need to take one pass and do a fungicide and a herbicide in the back. Now granted, it takes down the tank size, obviously, but um, we're able to do a lot of different things and some of the things we don't even know what we're gonna do going forward. So it's constantly changing as the years go and the technology advances. So that was the AI. So now we'll move into something that's just recently come out, and this is autonomy. When you started out in the spring, you work the soil, it just smells so fresh. When you till it up, and it's just the greatest smell. When I started farming, there basically was no technology. Every tractor was driven manually, everything was done manually. You'd be planting, you had to follow a line. If the sun was wrong, you would lose the line. Darkness, you couldn't see your marks. Moisture, you couldn't see your mark. Then you'd get squiggly rows. My name is Doug Nance. I'm a farmer from Blue Earth, Minnesota. I'm a fourth generation farmer, and I raised approximately 2,000 acres of corn and soybeans. I really never thought I would see an autonomous tractor in, in my farming career. For me, it was really exciting the first time I got to take the autonomous tractor to the field, swipe my phone, watch the tractor start with no one in the cab, start doing tillage, come to the end of the field, turn on the and do the tillage just as well as I can do myself with no one in the cab. I can pull up the app, I can monitor the tractor, see how much of the field has gotten tilled, I can check the fuel level, I can check the app to see how much of the field is left. If there was something in the field that it wasn't sure about, the tractor will stop and alert me. Is there something I can go around? Do I need to go out and remove an object from the field? The app gives me all this information so I can monitor it very closely. On farms, labor is always a challenge. We need labor or lots and lots of hours for short periods of time. The auto steer and technology has helped reduce our labor load, which makes my life a lot easier. Autonomy will help because we will be able to put a tractor on the field and let it run for 24 hours a day because it's not manned. 
but it also helps us with the weather because we can run so hard when soil conditions are fed. The thing that excites me the most about autonomy is not the locked in the tractor cab all day. It will just allow me to run my business better because I can just pay closer attention to other tasks. Now we'll be doing the jobs that we always wanted to get done that never had time to because we were in the cab all the time. Farmers are fairly traditional, but I have a feeling that once they try it, they will become very accepting of it. I think the tractor can do a better job than I can do. It's on me. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a life changer for me. The tractors driving themselves around fields. Maybe 20 years ago, this was completely and totally unheard of. And now we're really looking at this is really creeping up, and we're probably going to see this in our area in the next two years. It's really unheard of. It's, it's exciting technology, uh, especially when you consider that as far as autosteer, that, that level of product. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of autosteer, right? But the ability to, to track straight tractor drive itself that you're in the cab, that 20 years ago didn't exist. And now we're already staring at having tractors being able to drive themselves in the field. Complete work. Because that is one of the biggest the biggest challenges our producers have right now is finding a qualified labor force to be able to work fields and complete the jobs. So we have a couple pictures up here of what this actually entails. So there's a camera system on the front. Aaron can walk through that to stand there. So you can see the camera system right there on the suitcase weights, and then there's some on each side. <clears throat> and that's what, you know, he was saying that gives him a warning, right? If he sees something, rock, waterway, and then tells him, can I go through it? I got to go around it. It's all coming through the app, which that's the nice part with our machines, right? We're calling, calling in through our MTGs into the app, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, yeah, this is where the technology is going. Um, and right now it's just on tillage, um, but I know it will not stop there. Um, well, that's the thing, it's just a continuation of it. The guy in the video made a comment about how it can turn itself around at the end of the and then it actually has to know how to lift the tool out of the ground, shakes out of the ground, it's got to put them back in. That technology is already with us now. So with, like Jim said, auto track, yeah, we can tell the tractor, hey, you drive straight. And then we also have the automation, not autonomy, but the automation inside the tractor is like, I can set up a sequence when I get to the headland, yes, tractor, you will turn yourself around. It'll ask me if I want to turn left or right, and then I can also set up a sequence for it to either extend or retract the hydraulics to lift the thing either out of the ground or put it in the ground. We're just building on that technology of basically taking someone out of the seat. Well, this is autonomy. This is something we have to drive itself. As autonomy is coming, automation, we do have automation now. We do have levels of automation in our equipment. But like Jim said, if you talk to any grower, when we do our field visits, just that actual conversation, higher health is the biggest one. Yeah. So now we're going to go into some on combines. <laughs> John Deere Combine Advisor. Don't you get the most out of your S700 combine? with a suite of seven technologies. Using Activision cameras and sensors, the combine maintains its performance as conditions change. Bringing you the value of increased productivity in corn, soybeans, canola, wheat, and barn. Sorry. A little preface here. This video is like five years old. This came out in 2017. So as far as the, the technology that's on it, we got this video when that first came out. We're still using what's the common thing that you're actually seeing throughout these different levels of technology. 
You're on the spot. Um, <laughs> what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> we got cameras on everything, right? Yeah, right. That's through the whole thing. Sea and spray, ultimate spray, the economy on the tractor, and now the combine. So the combine advisor, yeah, it's a package of technology, but like, like we had to make clear, like this is this is old technology. We've had this for five years, but we're actually using this technology now. We've they've approved upon it, and we got a we got a package of basically the combine got smart. They didn't really make any changes with the combine itself from one model to the next. All they did was made it smarter. So what this machine can do is it takes those cameras and it says, "I'm looking at this clean grain coming up into the tank." Now, when we get back to the the ideal help or the help that's good, you still have to be able to set a combine. So if anybody's ever run a machine before or ran a combine, you actually got to set that machine to get to the sample you want or the productivity you want. But once you get that done, and once you say, this is how I want the combine to run, I push a button and the combine says, okay, give me a little bit, I'm gonna study this. How many of you have to study? I shouldn't say study, how many of you memorize stuff? That's how I got the combine. <laughs> So this combine is actually, once I push the button, it's like, all right, Brian, give me a minute. I'm gonna look at about 150 different pictures and I'm gonna memorize what you want. As long as you run the machine the way you want it run and it's set the way you want it set, I'll memorize these pictures. Once I get it in my head, I know exactly what you want, I'll turn this maintain feature off. And then as conditions change throughout the day, dries out, it's not as tough as it was in the morning, stuff's thrashing easy. What you see in the blue right there is the combine actually making adjustments to itself. It'll look at my pictures and say like, ah, we're getting kind of dirty. It's drying out, it's threshing easier. We got straw, we got chaff. I can either change my rotor speed, my chaffer, my sieve, my concave, and my wind. Combine does it all on, a, on its own based on those, on those what? Cameras. Yeah. <laughs> so when you think of this package that we got, we got it actually Thinking for itself and using the vision cameras to help change it here, I can actually control the speed. This here knows if it's going up and down a hill to actually make sure the grain doesn't fall off the back because our main goal here for the guy that's producing more food for the world, we don't want it to fall off the back of the combine. Right? We'd actually like to get that in the truck. So our main goal is to get every bushel off that acre. And if you look at a machine like this and when we get done with it out in the field and we set it up, what we really want with something like this is probably a bushel or less on ground is our loss. Is what we'll set a combine for. Alright, so this is the next picture. Here's the cameras that Brian was talking about. <clears throat> and they're taking pictures all the time. We got one on the clean grain. We also have one on the tailings. Okay? That's how it's making its decisions. But also even the customer can look at that when you come by corn how quickly the back window fills up. Those are key, still sending in pictures, so it's nice to be able to look at that, see if there's any changing. That picture up top, they kind of look like frying pans. They're actually, what we're using them for is, it's called something called active yield, but what it's doing is, it is taking measurements of weight of how that grain is coming in that grain tank and actually calibrating our yield monitoring system to get more accurate maps, get more accurate data, right? So we can make better informed decisions, or the customers can, right? So that I can change things for next year to produce more bushels, which in turn is gonna help my bottom line, right? Get more income, right? Yep. So right here, this is just one of the maps that we use a lot. Um, the neat part with our system here, um, it's constantly sending in this yield data. Yeah, all the, ma the machines now, when we're connected through a cell service, everything these machines are doing, they're recording anyway. So then we send this back to the customer's organization, but every 30 seconds, we're sending data back up. So we're collecting data. Did you, did you say at eight, seven, seven twenties or eight twenties? Seven twenties. You were kind of doing the same thing before. Did you have a little flip notebook in your pocket and you would write down everything? I just did what dad told me. Smart. I have a lot of guys that always have the pocketbook, the little flip note, and they wrote it down. That's, that's all we're doing. Yeah. We're just putting pretty colors and pictures to it. 
So there's just a, there's a huge amount of things that are changing and very rapidly. I mean, even like when we go back here, uh, you know, all these settings, uh, now that it's talking to each other through the cloud, we can actually, the owner of the machine can actually send settings to the combine and have his hire man accept them uh, without him even having to call them or anything. So there's just a lot of things that are constantly changing right now. As we talked about, when you turn this machine on, or this feature on, you, you have to know how to set the machine. Well, we have one good guy on the field. We have four machines in the field. One guy knows what he's doing. The other three are just, they're a warm body. Well, if one guy can actually set it, and if we have enough guy that's savvy enough with the technology, once one, one machine is set, and as long as we know other machines are calibrated the same or all the settings are pretty much identical, yeah, that one guy can connect to those three other machines through an iPad and then change the settings for those machines by themselves. I could do it. I could do it at the end of the field if I wanted to. Granted, those other three guys in the combine would have to accept my changes, but I could change them without actually being in the camp. And, you know, this, these yield maps, it used to take us days, if not months, um, or so weeks, but, I mean, there were guys, we had to physically take it off the screen, go put it into one computer, mm -hmm. and then upload it. Right? And it took a while to upload. And the interesting thing is it was on one computer, right? That's all you could look at was maybe that one, maybe another one, that's it. Now, I mean, any smartphone, tablet, computer, it doesn't matter. You can go check this out right now. And you're getting it 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty quick uh, to make some decisions pretty quickly. Not at the end of the harvest, but right when the issue happens, uh, which is huge or leaving bushels out there um, that we already spent money yep, to, get. to get. Want that other video? Well, yeah. The other video, like when we do the technology, we always try to think of ways to pencil it up, to show the customer, like, can I really make this look like it's worth something? I can sell them on it. I mean, I can do all the talking I want, but in the end, I need to prove it's worth it. Activision cameras see white caps while harvesting wheat. Combine advisor solves the problem by making adjustments such as increasing rotor speed and closing down the concaves. White caps and wheat would cause a 3% dock. Today I'm getting 540 for my wheat. On a regular day I can usually get 23 acres done in an hour and a typical 65 bushels per acre. So I get $8,073 per acre. White caps are tough though, and I've been docked before. At 3%, I'm only getting 524 per bushel. And even if I harvest just as fast, I'm only getting $7,834. Wow, I could save $240 an hour just on white caps. That was an example for just basically cleaning up our sample. If we do that for all the crops that are approved for that machine, even on the machines that customers are probably, you know, three bushel loss is fine, two bushel loss is fine. But as far as us making sure we get all the product off the field, or our main goal is to get everything into it, get it off of it, if a guy can go from 3%, even just on loss, to 1%, I, you're saving him two bushels an acre we can start penciling that off too. So I mean, Combine Advisor or the technology we have on the machines, all we're doing is just taking what we have and just getting the best use out of it. So just using his numbers, what that producer was talking about, about 1,000 acres, $24,000. Probably the machine was just a little bit smart. Now let's say you're a 10,000 acre farm. Right, so now you're $240,000. You didn't do any different, right? You already grew the crop. These good numbers get to be really large, really fast. You mentioned white caps? Yep. I mean, what, what, what causes that? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. There's a lot of, so we, vocabulary <laughs> is kind of another thing. Yeah. So we'll throw out a white cap, 
it's more or less kind of like a single kernel. It didn't make its way off the head of the grain, so it can take a weak, weak plant to get the head. Well, if I thresh it, a lot of times maybe the base of the stem, there might be the three kernels hanging there with the stem, well, that's just unthreshed. But if I get one kernel that still kind of has its coat around it, it's not completely threshed, we'll call it a white plant. So we're really just unthreshed material. So when I look at the technology on the combine, and there's some priorities that I have in there, I could probably work with the unthreshed grain, not all fresh grain, on the white cap. And it's... The don't want the white cap. They don't yeah. want the white cap. Because your bread makers don't want the white cap. Yep. Can't have it. And a lot of times it's, right, there's certain varieties, glad to eat, not to throw out certain ones or name drops, but uh, there's certain varieties that are harder than others to thrash out. Um, and then there's also a lot of settings, rotor speed, rotor clearance, um, things like that, that we can change uh, to try and get a better sample. You can leave that in the field. All right. So white cap is, is the chaff, right? Okay. And that chaff is what you want to leave in the field. The one on your green table sample. Because the buyers don't want it. So you'll get docked at the elevator for it. Uh, so that's what you meant by docked. That's docked, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and every crop has a dock. Yep. And every food crop Farm, has soybeans. a soybeans. There's, yeah, there's something that you can grow that comes with the crop that you don't want. So, pea pods, soybean pods. Okay. You're talking edible beans, pintos, white turtles, those kinds of things, splits. Yeah. We, we kind of started with the, if you think of it, we had the sprayer, we had the autonomy tractor, and then we have combine on there. So we got plant health, seed preparation, and then we're actually on the harvest side. Now the harvest side, what we're dealing with the farmer for planning on the next year. So a lot of this technology is there, but a lot of this technology does require some inputs from the operator in the off season. Well, when we're thinking of the off season and then we're thinking of harvest, on a combine too, the one thing that we want to make sure is good, like we also deal with a lot of residue management type stuff. So when we look at this uh, and you look at the actual yield maps, so when you talk about the dockage and stuff coming off the back, you know, we're still spreading straw out there, but, and when we did that, uh, sprayer test, we have the pictures with the stubble in it, the residue on there, so we're spraying with weed, but when we're out there, we also want to make sure our residue is spread out even too, so we have a lot of, everything ties back into the next cycle. Because a lot of times the harvest, we want to make sure that we're actually getting the straw out back of the machine even spread for the next following year when we do our application. Because right we'll come back into our seed spray or our sprayer to actually do our bird now. And everything's ready to go. Seed prep settings there for a no-till type thing. We're not tilling anything. We want to make sure our combine is doing our prep for us. And one thing I mentioned here um, on the yield maps, I know we talked about down to row, down to plant. That's the one area that we are not there yet. Okay, so right now this yield map is the width of the machine, right? The width of the head, right? Uh, if it's corn head or you know flex drape or whatever, it's the width of that. We're taking in all that, and then that's the yield there. Um, I don't know when that will change. I don't know what technology advancements will have to happen to get to where we know the yield per row or per plant. Uh, that's going to take some time, but. As of right now, that I just wanted to explain that we can do row per plant in different applications, but not yet on the yield yeah. yeah. Any questions? So that was it. Those were the three main topics. Now we could cover a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we actually went a little bit faster here because we ran all the time. We didn't get to quite do our question stuff for the afternoon. Yeah, we missed out on all. But you're clapping already, so it's only. It was a very good question. It was interesting. Well, thank you. Because <laughs> most of our. We, we do a lot of the talking on the technology. We do a lot of the training on the technology. We train service tech salesmen, and we also help with growers and get it going in the field. So a lot of this stuff that you see here, we, we run it. We run it. We're not office personnel. We are field personnel. We spend eight, nine months of our year out in the field with customers. 
Uh, back to your sprayer going plant by plant. How does that affect the uh, aerial sprayers? There's no way they can do something like that. Aerial spraying is, there's still a spot for that. So I mean, the certain application that I'm doing where I don't want to drive that machine into the crop, they'll still have their capacitation. Now, when you look at that sprayer that has the vision on it, the one that we're using up here, or the one that's the first one out to select that thing, it can only do green. So it, it has no way of identifying a weed from a plant, the one that we use. The one that actually can identify a weed from a plant is only working in corn, soybeans, and cotton, and on 30-inch rows. So in our area, the vision type sprayer is still just a burn down for us, which when we say burn down, it's a spring and a fall, just round up, basically round, just killing everything. Yeah. So that's, that's what we had this afternoon too, we did clear. Does everybody know what we mean by burn down? We're just out there spraying and kill stuff. Yeah. If it's out there, we're going to kill it. So like a lot of times with the spraying, we're going to kill off all the weeds before we see. Um, so that, you know, really anything out there is competing for the nutrients, right? Um, and that's why we want our crops to get all of it as much as we can for higher yields, right? And better quality. Um, but to the aerial spray, I mean, you know, we've seen two higher wheeled sprayers um, that the boots are way up high. Um, I know around my area, you'll see them spray sunflowers, um, maybe kill them off. Um, that's about it, other than fungicide, but a lot of fungicide is being put on by self-propelled sprayers. We don't see a whole lot of aerial, um, and it's just, it's changed, you know. But, and, I, and I think part of it, too, you know, was, well, they're not able to spray it today. Well, well, we need to spray it today, because if I don't spray it today, I'm losing bushels. But we have our own self-propelled sprayer up back here. Let's go spray it. Um, the conditions are good. He's spraying the neighbors. Right? I think that's some of the hang up with uh, commercial, and, and some areas have a lot of commercial guys going, and some areas don't. Because if I'm running over my acre seven times, but I have to hit it today or tomorrow, and it's going to be a week, um, we're rolling. And where the, the commercial or the aerial isn't going to get there. So I think that's where we've seen some of that changing. But we have. The accuracy and then what we can do with ours compared to an aerial. So with the with that spray system that we got where we're able to control individual nozzles, not so much the vision, but just the control every 20 inches, we control. That's a section now. Before it used to be seven or eleven sections on a spray, when we're controlling every 20 inches. With that ability now, when I make a turn, go around the slough, go around a rock pile. With that type of technology, I also have turn compensation, so my boom knows how fast it's going. So when this outside boom is starting to scream, it's fast, and my inside one is barely moving. Uh, each individual nozzle can control its rate. So these ones can, over, can adjust its apply, over apply, and these ones will cut themselves back so I don't kill the plant. And then over here, I'm not creating weed resistance. Because you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So if I'm not getting the right chemical out on that weight because it's going by too fast. I'm just making that plant stronger. Now I got chemical resistant weeds. So with the technology that we got in 17, I'm actually, that sprayer will adjust itself on the outer boom for going faster, make sure that right amount is getting applied. And it'll cut its way down on the boom that's inside that's not moving so fast. Something that an aerial guy can't do. So we're actually so accurate on the type of rates that we can do with that sprayer. Obviously, this is very expensive. Yeah. yeah how much? Uh, so, how, how big a farm do you need to justify this? The so the sea and spray part, the vision. We've done a lot of numbers on that, and Jim made comment to the spring into the fall. I got two applications that I can actually pencil that out on. So it's a base spray. The sea and spray or the camera option is just the technology package added on to it. And that package, that technology package, will add about 100 grams to that sphere to get the gaps. And is that something like it's just for the R's or can it go back like to 4730 or uh, like that? It's just for the R's. Yeah. Good question, though. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it, we see a lot of um, 
field installed kits that we can go back right to a certain point. Um, you know, like especially like this year, reserve can reclaim right uh, pressure reserve and some of those. Yeah, we can go further back on the R's, but uh, all those it's really nice because you're still got your old old sprayer and uh, you don't have that initial big investment you've already made, and then you can stick this newer technology on. Um, but, but, you know, when Brian said that 104, you know, I mean, you're like, oh, man, that's a lot. No, you got to remember, though, when you trade that machine in, you didn't lose all that money. Uh, that machine's still worth, you know, it still retains that value. Plus, to Brian's point, we can turn off that technology and run it just exactly like that. Same as any other sprayer, and then I can turn that technology back on and use it for what I want. The one thing I need to do is talk prices. <laughs> we can get you in contact with a really good sales. But we're not, <laughs> yeah. not salesmen. We're not salesmen. <laughs> not salesmen. To move prices, what happened? <laughs> Trade business. But yes, we have a lot of money invested in it. Growers have a lot of money invested in their equipment. And a part of our team is just making sure they know how to do And one thing too, you know, we, like Brian had said, I mean, we only hit some of our different models, right? But all, every single line, right? Trappers, planters, air drills, they're all changing, right? I mean, we have had advancements in technology and all of that. And we could have went through all that, but it took it a little while. Um, so we just wanted to hit some of the newer stuff. Um, but honestly, guys, there is, it's so, it dances so quick um, how we're seeding, how we're spraying, and even how we're combining. So. Maybe you have had the opportunity to, to point out that what stereotypically happens in farming 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Those days do not exist. This is extremely complicated. This is, this farming has changed. It's not what people think it is. And unfortunately, we have a lot of people in this country that do not understand where their food comes from or how they got it. No idea. No idea. So we just thought we'd have the opportunity just to share some of what farmers are doing as well. In this area, uh, somewhere else. Here. There was an issue that was raised this afternoon in the presentation about the technology and the claims that the book we're working with for changes in technology and other elements of ag practice in the United States to feed the world. Uh, and I recall the discussion is that maybe that's not the case, but there are places in the world with uh, productive soil uh, where they, they have the capacity, uh, the, the it's possible for the soil to grow it, but there are other factors that are limiting, so they're not likely to be any one area is going to be feeding the world's population. Am I remembering so that? So we're, we're going to, we'll go out on a limb here, because this is going to be just an opinion by us. Yeah. yeah this is our view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim Boss, so I got it. Yeah. Uh, right. This is my opinion. Uh, <laughs> the premise of the book was that changes in technology and policy in the U.S. would lead us to a point which we could sustainably feed the world. No. No, I don't think so. Yeah. We don't have the acres to do it, to feed the world. Um, even with the level of technology and, and where technology is going, are we really in a position where we could legitimately feed the world out of the United States? And the answer is, in my opinion, humble opinion as it might be, There are areas within the world that have the capacity to fill niches like that um, that I believe probably could make a huge dent in the food supply for the world. Um, but the reason they don't is because they're just severely underdeveloped. Uh, thank goodness for our farmers that they are underdeveloped, otherwise it would be in the world world. Right? Uh, I, I think the reality is that we definitely could make a much bigger push on the world stage for food production, um, and technology is one way of doing that. The other way you can do it is you can farm more acres. That's the other way it can be done. The problem is we're not making more land. If you figure out how to, write a book, 
<laughs> you will be rich beyond your wildest dreams. So we're not we're losing it every year. We lose farm and blade. So technology I believe is coming over here. But it's interesting to your you know, your point, I mean I think of fifty years ago, what were our yields? What were even the cattle, the livestock, right, that we were producing? It's not like it is today. Um, things have changed. Um, you know, you think of what, I mean, both me and Brian run cattle, beef cattle, and I mean, you think of what what is going to the market now, right? Um, totally different than 50 years ago, but if you'd ask someone who was farming 50 years ago, what were their yields of wheat? 20, maybe, you know? And, and I think of, we, we are, we're doing, we are advancing very quickly, but there's places, to Jim's point, in the world that they have not. Um, they're just trying to survive. So. Did that answer your question, Jim? It did, thank you. <coughs> well, that's all we have. Yeah. We don't want to hold in. He said, Gary said, yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those of you that have three by five cards, just leave them on the table and pick them up. Put it that way. Put it that way.